So good evening, everybody. I can see about three spare seats. Um, there's people coming on later. We've got some uh, additional seats. But this is the first time that we've had to move out of one of the lecture theatres uh, into the hall. And each of you are one of the 350-odd people that have come along tonight for the lecture. So we're thrilled, and thank you for your attendance. So on behalf of the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Monash University, Welcome to the 2015 Barry Reid Lecture, which I understand is the eighth, is that correct, Barry, in our series of Barry Reid Lectures. I'd especially like to welcome the person this lecture series is named after, Barry Reid, sitting down here in the front row, and of course his wife, Eileen, who was a colleague of ours in the faculty many years ago, for her to be here as well this evening. I've only got a few introductory comments because the stellar records and the achievements of both Barry and this evening's speaker are well, oops, are well described here um, in the pamphlet, so I won't uh, represent what's already there available for you to read. The only comments I will make, though, is that, as you are aware, or many of you would be aware, that Barry was a staff member here for 43 years. And upon his retirement, the staff of the faculty wanted to be able to recognise his immense contributions not just in terms of his work within the faculty, but his contributions to the profession, and indeed his mentorship and direction that he gave to so many people here during that time. And what we felt the best approach was, was to in fact have our only named lecture series within this faculty named the Barry Reid Distinguished Lecture Program. Now, of course, there's another major speech happening in Australia tonight. Many aspects of that have been leaked, and the presenter is not that popular and it's in Canberra, and it's called The Budget. It's the opposite to tonight. I'm told by Ian Wilding, and in fact, he didn't even let me see what he's presenting tonight, so nothing has been leaked. And based upon the number of people in the audience here, tonight's presenter is somewhat more popular than the other presentation that's going on up in Canberra. I'm thrilled to welcome Ian Wilding here to Monash this evening, and Ian's wife, Lizzie, who's sitting in the front row here as well. Ian and Lizzie, are both pharmacists. And then Ian has gone on and become a pharmaceutical scientist, an entrepreneur, an innovator, a developer of medicines, and an alchemist. And an alchemist in terms of being able to link science, medicine development, and commercialization all together. And there isn't a degree of alchemy that's required to be able to do that successfully once, twice, three times, and indeed many times as part of Ian's career. Not only does this faculty respect and recognise what Ian has done in his career and his contributions that he makes to our program here, so too does Monash University. And in fact, tomorrow at the graduation event at the main campus of the university, Ian will receive this university's highest academic honour that is, an honorary Doctor of Laws degree will be bestowed on Ian tomorrow afternoon at graduation. So on behalf of the university and those of us here tonight, Ian, congratulations. <laughs> so Ian, as a colleague and a friend, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the lectern to deliver your lecture entitled The Pharmaceutical Industry 2020. What does the future hold for the next generation of pharmaceutical sciences? Ian Wilding. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, my apologies. I will take full responsibility for tonight's weather. This clearly is uh, weather brought to you from the UK, from the colonies. Uh, so hopefully you will uh, bear with us and accept that. Uh, I have been very fortunate over the last couple of days to spend a lot of time with several of you in the audience, but also managed to spend a lovely hour with Barry yesterday uh, to learn a lot about his time here at Monash and to hear the history of how this Timpot College has become one of the world's leading faculties of pharmaceutical sciences and pharmacy. I say that with no um, intention to ingratiate myself to you, 
I tell it you because it's a fact. I travel the world. I see people in US, Europe, and Japan. Monash is internationally respected for what it does in the pharmaceutical sciences. So this evening, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the pharmaceutical industry 2020 and what does the future hold for the next generation of pharmaceutical scientists. However, we need to get off to a lighter start first, I think. Uh, as Bill has already explained, I'm very fortunate tomorrow to be the recipient of an honorary doctorate from Monash University. Bill asked me to send through a photograph uh, to use in the graduation documentation. So it's amazing what they can do with airbrushing and Photoshop these days. And so I'm pleasantly pleased by the image that you see behind you. It's better than the one I see in the mirror every morning. However, I was going to send a different photograph. And the one I was going to send to Bill <laughs> was taken in 2013 when I was fortunate enough to be down here in Australia when the British Lions turned over Australia in their own backyard. Now, I didn't send Bill that picture for two reasons. First reason, he'd have bloody well used it. In which case, I'd end up in real trouble. Secondly, we have a saying in England which is, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And so if I'd have gone for a rugby uh, story of that type, then the debacle that was England's performance in the World Cup this winter down here in Australia would have come back to haunt me. But that could all have been so different. What's not known is that the English coach, David Moores, nearly called on again the Silver Fox to come and help out the English cricket team down here in Australia. Lizzie and I were both on holiday together in Sri Lanka when the phone went. And David rang and says, you know what? Our batting order's not looking too good. We need some reinforcements. Can you get yourself down here and give some extra steel? Because actually, the last uh, English Silver Fox to play against Australia was David Steele in 1975 in the Ashes series with Thompson and Lilly coming at him. So there could have been a grey-haired chap bailing out England in the World Cup. However, we got to Colombo Airport and the call came through that unfortunately Bangladesh had somehow managed to turn England over at Adelaide. So Lizzie and I turned around, ended up going to the Maldives for three days. Much more fun. So where is Nottingham? Europe's a big place. But actually, when you put Australia onto Europe, you start to get a feeling of the size of the country in which you guys live. So Nottingham is that place with the red cross which actually is somewhere close to Newman Pullabarra in Western Australia. So, I had to think about what might be in Newman Pullabarra, and it turns out that the Australian equivalent of Nottingham is Mount Whaleback Mine, uh, 1,186 clicks north of Perth, and the largest open-cut iron ore mine in the world. So clearly, one of the largest exporting commodities from Australia. So that got me thinking, is Nottingham quite as desolate as that? Well, actually, no, that's not the case. But Nottingham has managed to give some pretty high-value exports to Australia, specifically to Monash. And I believe two of them are in the audience tonight. So Martin Scanlon, PhD, coming out of Nottingham in 1993. Now, I spent an hour with Martin yesterday, and he reminded me uh, that actually he had been a volunteer. Well, I use the word volunteer reservedly, because actually everybody had to be a volunteer in clinical studies that we were doing in Nottingham at that particular time. Uh, but Martin was able to tell me some stories about the videos we'd watched and the uh, nature of the cannulation that we'd done. But Martin's safe, because uh, I don't know that many funny stories about Martin. Uh, the other Nottingham export is Chris Porter. We call him Dip First Timer Porter. 
you call him Doogie Porter. Now Lizzie and I were very lucky to have dinner last night with Chris and Sue. And as we walked back to the hotel and said goodbye, we were, Lizzie and I were chatting in the uh, elevator going up. And I said, well, you know, I should tell some stories about Chris tomorrow night. And we thought, well, what about the ones of Friday morning after they'd been out at the Irish on Thursday night? What about the ones of the girls from the sock factory? Ah, that'll go down well. That'll get us into trouble. Alternatively, how about the first time that Chris went to AAPS with his mate Alistair Coop and the exploits that occurred on the plane and when they got there? No. Lizzie vetoed all of those. So I'm sorry. You're all going to miss out on those stories, although I suspect over a cocktail or two later you might persuade us to uh, tell one of those. But what I did want to talk about in terms of Chris is the fact that actually I've known for a very long time that Chris was going to end up being a pharmaceutical scientist down here in Australia. One of my so-called claims to fame is the use of an imaging technique called gamma scintigraphy to understand the behavior of formulations in the gastrointestinal tract. And Chris was a, a dutiful Nottingham PhD student and volunteered willingly for several studies. And he, he, here is uh, visual proof that uh, Doogie Hauser MD did in fact do a PhD in Nottingham at the age of 16 to 18. You know, we took them young in Nottingham back in those days. And I have to say, Sue, you look pretty good as well in those days. Not like, of course, you do today, but obviously, you know, one has to look back a little bit. Now, gamma scintigraphy allows us to see inside the body, understanding the GI tract. And so I went back and pulled images from 1989, when Chris took part in scintigraphic studies. And you'll see very quickly from the images why we knew that Chris was destined for a career down under. As you can see, he has a upside down gastrointestinal tract. So I can assure you that when we looked at all the images on Chris, there was always something a little bit odd about his anatomy. And that always there was the little curvature that gave us a bit of a fool. So Chris, and Martin, you are high-value exports to Australia. If you ever fancy export for import, we'll have you back any time you want, but I have a little feeling you guys are settled here. So, let me get to some of the serious stuff. Ten years ago, I was invited to Japan to give a keynote presentation at a major conference in Atami about what I thought the future may hold for the pharmaceutical industry. It was one of, one of those odd presentations because as I prepared for it, I didn't really have my inspiration in terms of what I was going to address, which was getting slightly unnerving. However, I jumped off the plane at Narita uh, and was walking through the uh, immigration uh, arena to customs. And there was a large billboard on the left-hand side which actually was promoting the launch of a new film that it was just about to be shown in Japan. And that was the film, The Day After Tomorrow. Now, for those of you who are not old enough to remember, and haven't got the memory to recall, the film, The Day After Tomorrow, was about a world that ignored the signs and symptoms of climate change. And suddenly, overnight, Eastern USA was hit by a tsunami and an ice age. And in fact, the symbolism here is clear, that's Wall Street, which of course is the home, to some degree, of the global pharmaceutical market. And so what I did in the presentation in Japan 10 years ago was sow the seeds as to the issues that were impacting on the future prosperity of the pharmaceutical industry. And the data I showed the guys then was that the number of new drug approvals was continuing to drop. The number of new revenues from our exciting R&D activities was dropping because we were getting fewer and fewer products to market. Also in the same context, what we were observing was a higher cost per successful drug developed. 
So all these statistics were coming out at the beginning of the 2000s. 900 million US dollars from Tufts, 1.7 billion US dollars from Bain, 1.6 billion dollars from Lehman Brothers. These were the estimates of the cost of individual drug development. And so I was trying to argue at this particular meeting that we needed to change our approach to drug development, to recognize these changing factors, these global warming parameters. In fact, in 2005, The Economist summarized it far better than I can. It was about nine months after I'd given this presentation in Japan. And what they showed quite eloquently is that if, you start, if you're spending more and getting less, then you don't really need an MBA to tell you that's not sustainable. Something has to give. You can't keep spending large amounts of money if you're not going to get the return on investment. So that was 2004, 2005. Now 2015. What, what has happened in that intervening period? Well, this is a slide that comes from a good friend of mine, uh, Andres Wolnoffer, who's global head of development at Roche. And I was chairing a phase one conference in London last year when he presented this slide. And the phrase deja vu is really uh, what you're going to see in this slide because this is, these are the facts that did occur in 20, by 2014. We had indeed spent a considerably large amount of money on R&D, an increasing amount, up from 26 billion in 2000 to over 50 billion in 2012. The number of new drug approvals was indeed flat. There was no change in reality between 2000 and 2013. And peak sales are, were indeed declining. We were seeing a drop-off in the revenues. Our top-line growth was no longer there. So given I was a humble pharmaceutical scientist in 2004, how was I able to predict something that the industry it failed itself to realize? Well, of course, the answer is the industry did realize, but it was just in denial. It buried its proverbial head in the sand and wasn't willing to understand the challenges that were going on around it. Put another way, I've talked to you about climate change. Many of you will have seen the film An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, the documentary. And in that film, he finishes with a quote. And that quote is from the famous American novelist Upton Sinclair. And it's a really important quote because it summarizes culturally the challenge we have in our industry. And that quote is, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. So it's really hard to think about productivity and its implications for people when actually the consequence is more than likely that several people, maybe including the person who's got to make the decision, is going to lose their job. But nevertheless, that's going to be at the heart of what I try and take you through now as to what I think will be the challenges over the next five years. But let's start off with some statistics. This is from an excellent review article published in January 2014, which looks at the clinical development success rates over the, the period from 2003 to 2011. This is the most authoritative list of success rate data that you will obtain anywhere got 4,451 drugs, 7,372 separate development paths, 835 companies. It's already out of date because it's a period that has already been and gone, but it's the most authoritative data set we've got. I want you to focus solely tonight on the bit in the middle where the blue curve is, the highlighted blue bit. What that shows us is that 32% of the drugs that go into phase two drug development make it to market. 60% of drugs that go into phase three make it to market. So 40% of drugs that enter so-called pivotal testing fail. Think about how much that costs alone. Also, what you see in that slide is that 10% of drugs that go into man have a potential to be approved. So the likelihood of approval for a drug that goes into man 
is about 10%. Now, most of us who are seasoned voyeurs in this particular arena will tell you that's an overestimate based on what we now know. What actually the stats typically look like is one in 20 drugs that go into man make it to market. 95% of new drugs that go into humans will fail. Failure is the most likely outcome of our innovation. But, this will be something I'll come back to time and time again, large pharma in particular will not look to de-risk those assets early enough, but will spend large amounts of money with those programs before they drop them. If you're going to make this work, you have to fail cheap, fail quick. And I'll come and explain that to you in detail during this Barry Reed Distinguished Lecture. But I want to spend a moment now just to actually explain to you what we know about what does correlate and what doesn't correlate with success rate. And again, a really good re review paper in Nature Review's Drug Discovery from a couple of years back listed out on this particular slide factors that don't correlate with success or failure in drug development. So it doesn't matter how big your company is in this context. Big companies, small companies, will all have the same potential for success or failure. It doesn't matter where you're based in the world, where your corporate headquarters are. It doesn't matter what your, the indication market size is, whether it's a small indication or a blockbuster. A wide range of therapeutic areas, it doesn't matter again in the context of whether or not they give you a better chance of success. The target family doesn't correlate with success or failure. The molecular properties don't correlate with success or failure. So what does? They're much softer and more important factors. The first one is one that should appeal to everybody in this room, which is the indicators of scientific acumen do correlate with success or failure in drug development. The publications per dollar R&D, the patents per dollar R&D, the citations per publication, all those indicators of scientific acumen are linked to success or failure in drug development. There are a couple of easy and hard therapeutic indications that come into play. We all know the challenge of neuroscience. But what's really interesting for me, as somebody who consults for 30 pharmaceutical and biotech companies across the globe, is it's the indicators of good judgment that do strongly correlate with success in drug development. The R&D tenure, the experience base of the R&D team, the frequent mention of return on investment is something that positively correlates with success in drug development. Frequent mention of decision making is something that's been shown to correlate positively with success in drug development. And not surprising, the early termination of projects is also something that's a positive correlate. Those are relatively soft issues, but again impact on the structural nature of our industry and something I'll try and build into a brief thesis with you tonight. So here we are. This is our universe. This is the area in which we plough our trade. The centre of our universe is large pharma, the big pharmaceutical com companies. They are the star in our, in, in, in our galaxy. Circling around that, we have specialty farmers who are focused in very niche therapeutic areas. We have biotech companies. These are private companies or publicly funded companies, small companies typically, not many people, uh, focused on developing assets. Academia, we all understand, and the contract research organizations that provide support structures to the individual components of this universe. That is the pharmaceutical food chain in which we find ourselves. Within that food chain, large pharma is the biggest player. Clearly, it's, in many people's minds, the most important player. Large Pharma does, simply put, five key things in terms of its modus operandi. It does discovery. It does early development. It does late-stage development. It does registration. It does sales and marketing. It takes a molecule on that journey through discovery to commercial. Simple terms, that's what Large Pharma is about. Where does large pharma obtain its product innovation? Where does, where does product innovation 
access itself in terms of pharma. Three areas. The internal discovery effort, the work that is done by those groups in large pharma that we saw on the preceding slide, over there on the far left-hand side, the discovery effort within large pharma. Secondly, it comes from those biotech companies who are developing innovative assets. It comes from academia. Currently today, 2015, the sources of product innovation for large pharma are in those three discrete areas. My belief is that by 2020, large pharma will largely have ceased to undertake its own internal discovery activities. So large pharma by 2020 will focus on only three building blocks. Late stage development, registration, sales and marketing. Now you might say that's a bit brazen, it's a bit bold. Come on, you're a young man from Nottingham, how do you dare come over here and tell us that's what's going to happen? It's already happening. This is uh, an analysis by uh, Thomson Reuters and Deloitte uh, from last year. They looked at the top 12 big farmers late stage pipeline and looked at where the innovation had been sourced from. What you can see is that the external innovation coming from acquisitions, co-development or licensing cumulatively adds up to about 64%. So what we can see, is that 64%, 64% of the late stage pipeline valuation comes from external innovation. Only one third comes from internal innovation. I'll teach you to try and turn around. I think I'll just look at you guys. You're much prettier than my slides are. But what we've got here is evidence already in 2013, 2014, that the late stage pipeline of the large pharmaceutical companies is coming from external innovation. It's not coming from their internal development activities, internal discovery activities. Now you might say, well, anybody can pick one set of data and come to a conclusion on it. I'm going to go better than that. Let me show you the Goldman Sachs January 2014 hit list of high potential pipeline drugs that pharma has. They broke it into four categories. In licensing, acquisition via biotech, acquisition of large firms, or in-house discovery. Only eight of the high potential pipeline drugs come from in-house discovery the overwhelming majority of those are sourced externally. Now some of you may be voyeurs of statistics and have seen the 2014 FDA values. So 2014 for the FDA was a massively successful year. 41 new drugs were approved in 2014. Surely that means large pharma internal discovery is responsible for that. 15 of those 41 drugs come from the top 10 large pharma. Over 50% of those were sourced externally. The evidence is already there. All I'm doing this evening is recounting to you what we already see happening in front of us. The, the landscape in which we are working is changing, changing extremely rapidly. So why is large pharma less good at discovery and early development than those biotechs? Well, let's look at some language around this. Now, Bruce Booth is a partner at Atlas Ventures in Boston, one of the most innovative uh, venture capital firms in the US. Bruce writes a blog, well worth a look. And I've just selected a few quotes from Bruce's blog to illustrate tonight's story. First quote, 
Cost constraint may be the mother of frugal innovation, but huge legacy fixed costs make frugality hard to imagine. So frugal innovation is what we normally do routinely as individuals. We do things as cheaply as we can, as uh, innovatively as we can. Large farmers lost the knack to do that because actually it's hard for them to imagine what frugal innovation is like. And that's actually typified by the second quote that Bruce uses. Big budgets embody most of what farmer does. Every program tends to be built like a gold-plated Cadillac, saving a day on the launch is viewed as more important than de-risking each incremental dollar, and no one wants to be the project leader who failed to check all the boxes. That, in essence, is the nature of big companies, where risk-taking is not necessarily supported. Third bullet point. Organizational acromegaly created a body full of legacy excess infrastructure technology and staffing all in the hope of achieving more launches. But the organizations couldn't cope and couldn't deliver. Plagued further with the institutional baggage of this corporate evolution, innovation suffered, culture went sour. Culture will be a theme I keep coming back to tonight. Here at MIPS you have an awesome culture in terms of what you do here. But you are a small organization where you can manage culture in a much easier way than you can in those large pharmaceutical companies. <clears throat> I want to try and explain briefly uh, where the sweet spot for innovation lies in the early development activities and how that's differentiated between what you typically see from large pharma and smaller companies. So the traditional approach, uh, which is going from preclinical through phase one, phase two, phase three, to launch, has largely been replaced in most people's minds by a quick win, fast fail strategy. This comes from a paper published in December of last year, which I'm not an author, but I'm acknowledged in. It's some work we did over 10 years uh, with a division of Lilly called Chorus, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. What we're looking at here is an R&D sweet spot. How can we look as early as possible in achieving the best chance of de-risking a molecule using the minimum investment possible so we can truly fail cheap, fail quick? But I just wanted to briefly do a scientific segue, uh, which is around the traditional paradigm and something I showed earlier on in statistics. Uh, I, said ex I showed that in terms of drug success rates uh, over the period from 2003 to 2011, only 60% of drugs that went into phase three got to market. So 40% were failing in phase three. Now Pfizer published a really interesting paper in 2012 in Drug Discovery Today, which they called the three pillars of survival. And what they argued in that paper is to maximize success going from phase two to phase three, i.e. at the cheaper side, phase two, before you go into the expensive phase three studies, you don't want a phase three failure. You need to have three things. You need to have exposure at the target site of action over a desired period of time. You need binding to the pharmacological target as expected for its mode of action. And you need expression of pharmacological activity commensurate with the demonstrated target exposure and target binding. <clears throat> now this paper has been widely received by our industry, but I have to say I found myself scratching my head. Isn't that common sense? Why, why would that be a paper in Nature Drug Discovery Reviews? Haven't we learned anything from that great pharmaceutical scientist, Casanova? Casanova, 18th century. Philosopher, adventure, and cad. What did he say? He said, medicine in the hands of a fool is poison, just as poison becomes medicine in the hands of the wise. Isn't that exposure at the target site of action over a desired period of time? Isn't that, in reality, the right amount of drug in the right place at the right time doing the right thing? We've lost our common sense perspective in drug development as an industry. That's one of the problems that we need to legislate for as we move forward. 
At the end of the day, drug development is difficult, but if we don't use common sense, we're in real difficulty. So whilst I admire the Pfizer paper and what it did in terms of doing a meta-analysis of their own uh, errors of judgment, I can't help thinking and wondering, how the hell did we get there in the first place? So, that's the neatest segue I can find to this particular slide, which is a, a wonderful uh, schematic from a great paper. It's in the Harvard Business Review. It's published in 2008. And it tries to articulate the differences between early development and late stage development. And what's necessary in terms of organizational goal, organizational strength, organizational approach. In terms of an organizational goal, in early development, we want to seek the truth. We do not want to know quickly whether we've got uh, the poison chalice or the wonder child. In late stage development, we want to seek success. We should have already adequately de-risked the molecule by then. We're pushing hard towards success. In terms of organizational strength, in early development, we're trying to establish whether something's truly got value. Has it really got promise? In late stage, we're trying to take the product to market. In terms of the culture, the organizational approach, in early development, we want to reduce risk. In late stage development, we want to maximize value. In early development, we want to maintain loyalty to the experiment. In late stage, loyalty to the product. In early, we want to focus on the science. In late, we need to focus on the commercialization and regulatory strategy. In early, we need to work in small experiment-based teams with an emphasis on testing. In late stage, we want to work in large product-based teams, emphasizing refining because we've got regulatory boxes to tick. So my thesis to you is you can't do both those things in the same company because culturally they are so different. The risks and rewards are materially different. Part of my evidence for that and my experience of that comes from the fact that for 10 years, I've been an external consultant to a division of Lilly called Chorus. Chorus is a full-service, autonomous R&D division of Lilly. We're not bound by Lilly's governance and corporate structures. Chorus employs 35 people and typically takes 12 to 15 assets from candidate selection through to proof of mechanism, proof of principle, proof of concept. The role of Chorus is to find the low-hanging fruit studies that will adequately de-risk that molecule or not, and to do it quickly and to do it cheaply. What we don't do is plan for success. We don't do any parallel processing, ready for phase two and beyond. We simply focus on what we have now in our hand. One in 20 drugs make it to market, 19 out of 20 fail. So we're looking to increase the probability of technical success as quickly and as cheaply as we can. And we'll do that with efficient, timely decision making. Go back to that first slide about what correlates with success in drug development. I'm not going to take you through the slide in detail. Again, it's in the publication that came out at the end of December last year. But it looks at the asset flow through Chorus. What you can see here is in terms of positive exits to Lilly, then there are, in essence, eight molecules that made it back to Lilly with an increased probability of technical success and ones which we recommended that they move forward within their own development pipeline. There is a large number of negative exits. We celebrate those equally as well as those that were successful. We did them cheaply. We did them efficiently. We used our dollar optimally. So, What does the new pharmaceutical food chain look like? Well, our son's been through a bit of a dwarfing experience. Large pharma is going to reduce its footprint. It's never to be the case. If it stops doing discovery and stops doing early development, it's going to reduce its footprint. However, there's a material growth in the uh, satellites that are going around that. Biotech will increase in size in terms of product innovation it provides to pharma and beyond. Academia will increase in its prominence in terms of product innovation in the drug space coming out of our global universities. Especially pharma will change its emphasis 
to become even more focused on niche applications. And the CROs will have to change their business models because they typically work in a different way with small companies than they do large companies. Again, to give some evidence as to why this is already happening, if we look at some of the ways in which venture capital is coming into our industry, historically venture capital used to come in for doing novel drug R&D and doing drug improvement R&D. What we've seen over recent years is that over 80% of the venture capital money coming into therapeutics is going towards novel R&D. It's going to help funding those biotechs and groups within academia. We're moving towards more novel R&D in this space. We also look at the fact that VCs now are increasingly starting to back what we call early stage assets. These are assets that are still coming out of discovery, going through into phase one. The amount of money going to those assets is increasing. We've seen some really successful IPOs in the US in recent times on companies that are not yet in the clinic. So the use of private and public money to help fertilize this food chain is growing apace. So coming towards the end, what does it mean for us as pharmaceutical scientists? You, know, you could be there now thinking, goodness me, that's depressing. Let me try and give you the uplifting finish. But first of all, a comment, an anxiety. The current pharmaceutical scientists can sometimes be seen as having narrow and deep expertise. Phenomenally knowledgeable, really world class, but in a relatively thin area of activity. A bit like deep sea drilling. I worry that if we create sector experts as the pharmaceutical scientists of the future, then that won't help us in the new world in which we find ourselves. Because I was trained as a pharmaceutical scientist in the 1980s. I was trained holistically about the interplay between medicinal chemistry and what that might mean for dosage form design and how that would interface the pharmacokinetics and what I would do with that in terms of clinical strategy. I was privileged to be educated holistically in the interplay of the key factors that go into determining the chance of success or failure with a program. Now what I'm not arguing for here is a return to what I think could have been in some places substandard pharmaceutical education in this holistic jack-of-all-trades environment. But what we must do is remember that dr early drug development is about understanding the consequences of things, the domino principle. If I change one thing, it impacts on something else. So what we can't have in, in the new world, outside large pharma doing early discovery and development, is people who just know what they do. They have to know enough to engage with their colleagues on issues that impact on chance of success or failure. It's really important that we go back and understand how we're going to pull people together that have that interplay of skills while still giving, giving them expertise but giving them context, the context in which the science plays a role. So, to finish tonight, I actually think the future is really, really bright for our profession. Now, I'm a child of the 70s. Uh, I, I was born in 1963. Neil Aidan Armstrong walked on the moon in 1969. I wanted to be an astronaut. It's not surprising, therefore, that my favorite ever TV program was Star Trek. And I always was uh, Spock. And so to finish with tonight, I'd like to finish with this, which is, there's life, Barry, but not as we know it. Well, I'm going to say thank you, Spock. That was particularly well done. Barry Reid, I'm going to invite you up to the lectern now. Captain Barry. The man who played Spock died the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Nimmo.
and you don't have the errors for it. So, Dean Charman. Sorry, my, my wife tells me that my lectures are good because no one ever hears them. <laughs> we, we've just heard the thoughts and predictions from one of the world's most accomplished pharmaceutical scientists. He's also a, a brave man. Um, for as Woody Allen tells us, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. We're also told, at this time not by Woody Allen, that the world is full of magical things, full of wonder, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. Our speaker has proved himself to be a man of very sharp wits and adept at exploring the world's magic by way of intelligent research. There's several sorts of research I've discovered. Congratulations on intelligent research. But now I want to talk to you about our local butcher. Um, this goes back a few years ago and he's now moved on, so you can't catch the tram and go and see him. It's said that a really good philosopher uh, can walk into a butcher shop and convince the butcher that there's no such thing as meat, that meat doesn't exist. And I think that's how a philosopher probably gets a defill. But not my butcher. It seemed at the time that he uh, wouldn't have fallen for that one. There were, there were a number of weeks and indeed months when I thought he might be one of the unsung greats of philosophy. But it wasn't to last. The shop's not far away from here. It's in a reasonably large or moderately large shopping centre in Keeler Road. I could tell you how to get there. You follow Mount Alexander Road to the third. <laughs> it, it was known as the Mount Alexander Road because during the gold fields it was the busiest road in the world. As everybody went towards Mount Alexander for the gold fields. So this was a standalone shop and several work butchers worked there and I never knew who my particular butcher was. I never met him and now he's gone. So you, you go to the shop and when you look at the left hand corner there's this, this great big blackboard or chalkboard if you like. And the first time I ever went there I expected to see that lamb cutlets were whatever and that um, you know braised steak or whatever was a certain price. But instead of that he had this aphorism, an aphorism being a pithy statement of a greater truth. So I thought I'd get that over. Um, and it says Drop all your cleverness and practice wonderment. And there's no attribution. So why did I see this as being significant? Why am I still thinking about it ten years later? Why am I talking about it? What's it mean? What's it saying to us? You're probably thinking, is it worth thinking about? Does it apply to research in the pharmaceutical sciences? And the questions we're, we're familiar with, do we have to know it? And is it on the exam paper? <laughs> and what comes after drop? <laughs> but it was drop all your cleverness and practice wonderment. Why was it in a butcher's shop? Who, who and what was this butcher? Some years later I came across another version of this aphorism and it was attributed to 
Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. He lived from 1749 to 1832, and people know him as the German Shakespeare. And we all know him because he wrote the words to the Ode to Joy, which was in, um, is in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the, the final movement. And I noticed they sing it as a carol lately. So we know Goethe. And his version was, sell all your knowledge and buy wonder. It's like a stock exchange prediction, isn't it? So the butcher's aphorism was not entirely original. Was I to lose faith in him or her? I don't know who wrote it there. But what's wrong with a butcher who has a knowledge of Goethe? So I kept my faith. More recently I discovered almost identical aphorisms as far back as the 13th century in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Persia, um, ascribed to Rumi who lived in the years 1207 to 1273. So this aphorism was part of the ancient wisdom tradition. Mr. Kopok probably heard it. Should I lose faith in my butcher? But what's wrong with a butcher who is a scholar of ancient wisdom traditions? a scholar of perennial wisdom. Some weeks or months later, I'm usually not allowed to go to supermarkets because I have to walk up and down and read the things and that's not proper shopping, I'm told. So, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm really allowed out. <laughs> but some weeks or some months later, I returned to the shopping centre and I was full of expectation. There was a great philosopher butcher here. And I went straight to the butcher shop to look at his blackboard. And you can imagine my excitement. There was a brand new aphorism there. And it was, never eat more than you can lift. <laughs> and it was ascribed to Miss Piggy. So this, this took me back a bit. I mean, I guess it's fairly wise dietary advice. <laughs> and butchers do sell pork. Perhaps the butcher wasn't a philosopher after all. Perhaps he just had a book of quotes. But he certainly had an effect on me. The last time I ever went to see anything at the butcher's blackboard. It said, Merry Christmas to all our customers. <laughs> Which is a bit pretty selfish, because, you know, I wasn't a customer, and why, why wasn't I entitled to a Merry Christmas? But that's another philosophy. It seems to me that Professor Wilding is a practitioner of the wisdom traditions that we discussed earlier, not the one about Miss Piggy. I, I think, trying to unpack this aphorism, that, and I was going to take a longer time than I, than I was now going to do, that sell your knowledge, remember it was sell your knowledge and, and buy wisdom or buy wonder, etc. But I, I think sell your knowledge or drop your cleverness that this book you put up there means to approach all things free from preconceptions, free from expectations, free from any prior knowledge, to have the don't know mind of Zen. 
I might do that one another night, actually. But in a more jocular interpretation, sell your knowledge means to become a pharmaceutical consultant. To sell your knowledge to the pharmaceutical industry. And that's the plain meaning of sell your knowledge. And Professor Wilding has done just that. Professor Wilding gave up a career in community pharmacy. He worked in community pharmacy. He was a manager for six weeks, I think, in, in northern Birmingham. And he started his activities, he tells me, the night after a major break-in. But he, he gave up community pharmacy and he went back to study for a PhD at Nottingham because he realised his joy was research, that research was his study of wonderment. And he's done wonderfully well in his investigations of wonderment. So, sir, you get full marks and a koala stamp for your wisdom, both ancient and modern, and for the insights you've shared with us tonight. So thank you very much, and I'd ask you to come. <laughs> now, this weighs a tonne, and he's going to get excess baggage and... But it's worth it. He knows what it's all about. We spoke about it the other day. But I'd like you to accept that as a token of a wonderful lecture that you gave. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.